Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. The next lecture, lecture number 6 is based on the techniques that are used for the structure elucidation of natural dyes. In the previous lecture and the penultimate previous lecture, we saw how these structures are different from one another. So, now we will go on to learn how to know the structure characterization of any dye, whether it is natural dye or synthetic dye, but we will take an example of natural dye because all along we will be studying more and more details about the natural dyes. Studies on analysis, identification of natural dye started as early as 1930s that a French chemist, Pitzer, used a microchemical analysis method in which he achieved the result by color reaction with different chemicals. Abraham et al. in 1964 reported a method using infrared structural analysis. Many workers have used thin layer chromatography for identifying natural dyes in textile. So, at least you know that there are methods which you know can be either microchemical analysis method or infrared spectroscopic method or thin layer chromatographic method. So, at least these names have now come newly to you, but at least we will now when we talk in detail about it, you will be able to appreciate their these processes in a better manner. Various methods are used in identification. The various methods used in identification of natural dyes are under the category of chromatographic methods, which includes thin layer chromatography, column chromatography, high pressure liquid chromatography, gas chromatography. So, four methods of chromatographic techniques have been used for the identification of structure of natural dyes. Similarly, there are four major spectroscopic methods popularly used. One is UV visible spectrometry, FTIR spectrometry, NMR spectrometry and mass spectrometry. So, these are four spectroscopic methods which are popularly used both for natural dye identification and for synthetic dye identification. UV visible spectroscopic method is a method that studies were carried out first by Schweppes in 1988. Identification of dye in historic textile using chromatographic and spectrometric methods as well as by using sensitive color reaction were done by Schaeffer, a non-destructive method was reported of faded dyes on textile fiber through examination of their emission and excitation spectra. High performance liquid chromatography that is HPLC has been used by Walker et al. in 1986 to identify synthetic as well as natural dyes. So, it is not just a method which is meant for synthetic dye alone, but it is a common method which could be applied to synthetic dyes as well as natural dyes for their identification of structure, because both are chemical entities. The first thing that we do in the characterization of natural dye is to look at the solubility factor. If they are organic chemicals, they need to be either identified by spectroscopic methods or by means of chromatographic methods. And the four chromatic, me 
chromatographic methods that are used are TLC, column chromatography, HPLC and GC. And the four spectroscopic methods we have just mentioned which are popularly used for the identification of natural dyes are UV visible, FTIR, NMR and mass. Then another studies that prompted to show whether it was a dye or a pigment is through the ability to study the solubility. And if you remember we had spoken about the solubility that a dye is different from a pigment, a dye is soluble and a pigment is insoluble. So, this is the first step that we carry out. How to determine the solubility? Various techniques that are used for characterization of natural dyes mentioned below and one of them is solubility of extracted dye. It is determined in different solvents. Extraction is done on the basis of polarity that is in water, ether, methanol, alcohol, acetone, ethyl acetone, dilute acids and alkalis. The solubility is determined both at room temperature and higher temperature so that it is one method of finding out whether a dye is soluble, water soluble or solvent soluble. Because some of the very distinct aromatic dyes which are colored compound may or may not have these oxochromic groups of OH and NH to which does not make it a water soluble substance. So, if there is OH or NH it makes it water soluble. Common solvents that are used for solubility determination therefore, it is important that one should know the solubility of these dyes and therefore, you know a whole array of solvents like water, ether, methanol, ethyl alcohol, acetone, ethyl acetate, dilute acids and alkalis have been used and they are one of the best solvents that can be used to determine. A dye is taken, it is first dissolved in water, then kept aside. Then again another sample of the same dye is taken and ether is added. So, that, that it gives an idea in which solvent the dye solubilizes best and which colored moiety is present. Some indication can be obtained. Then comes the thin layer or the column chromatographic methods. Of course, they are quite similar. So, I have put them together. In the thin layer and column chromatographic studies, thin layer chromatography is a versatile technique for identification of natural dyes. It is popularly known as TLC. The TLC studies carried out on dye extract using suitable eluent for a specific dye. The spots are visualized in visible light as well as in iodine chamber and the possible constituents of the extracts are identified by comparing TLC data that is the color of the spot, the RF that is the uh, you know the area to which it has traversed can be known. Retention factor is the word which is represented by RF. Column chromatography is used to separate the colored compounds from single dye or mixture of dyes after eluting with a suitable solvent. This is also used as cleanup procedure for subsequent instrumental analysis. Unless and until we have pure dye molecule from the mixture of dyes which are present in the common extract from the natural dye source, there is no point of doing spectroscopic analysis. So, solubility is to evaluate the thin layer chromatography, understanding in which solvent the colorant is soluble and subsequently the thin layer chromatography gives us an idea as to what should be the polarity 
of the solvent while uh, separating the compound in column chromatography. So, the TLC is carried out on small glass plates which are coated with silica mainly, but sometimes with alumina and these are very nicely you know coated. So, that the coating is fine and thin on the glass plate and then the when the compound or the dye is spotted, it is allowed to elute in solvent system and by the action of capillary movement, the solvent moves upward in that plate along the coated surface. Thus, spot starts moving and when the spot starts moving, because of the difference in polarity, this showed different spots on the plate. I will give you an example of how TLC looks like. Now, if I have to show you TLC, this is how it looks. This is an indigo dye which is showing uh, also along with the blue spot, a red spot which fades after some time. So, this is an example that it is a natural indigo because only natural indigo has this pink spot whereas, if you spot a synthetic indigo it will never show this pink spot. So, this is how by TLC we can identify. This is due to the presence of a very small quantities of this indigo which is red in color and in the case of natural indigo only it will be present. So, suppose yesterday we were talking about that you know that there is a demand of synthetic dyes and lot of people are mixing up natural dyes and synthetic dyes. This is one method of identifying that natural dyes can be identified by looking at merely this TLC. So, an indigo dye can be identified by thin layer chromatography. So, how do we identify? It is very easy to identify whether it is a sample of synthetic indigo or whether it is a sample of natural indigo because molecular structure wise they look the same. Why? Because natural indigo will have a reddish spot below the blue spot and that is the only possible because it is coming from the natural isomer. Because iso indigo comes hand in hand with natural indigo, but when it is prepared in the laboratory, it is only one molecule which is the blue one. So, when a sample of synthetic indigo, there is no red spot coming and therefore, this is a very good method of identification of natural indigo dye. So, one should be careful in looking at the TLC and then evaluating whether it is a sample of natural indigo or synthetic indigo. So, this is how TLC is used. The retardation factor or the retention factor. After thin layer chromatography, there are a few points that need to be clarified that CL, silica gel is the main coating material which is used and it is the reaction of the dyes molecules with the silica whether it is adhering to the silica or not. So, adhering will decide the polarity of the dye and accordingly the polarity of the solvent will then be chosen and once the desired chosen solvent system is taken that dye starts moving at a different RF. RF means retardation factor or retention factor and that RF of dye 1 and dye 2 will always be different in different polar solvents. So, therefore, the solvent polarity is of prime importance and secondly the RF of the dye is of importance. It can be actually because these are all colored molecules they can be seen by naked eyes under visible light or sometimes these TLC plates can then be developed in iodine chambers. 
So, they become brown spots and one can actually see the dye molecule on the TLC. See these are different dyes which show different TLCs and this is how the spot moves and the upper dotted line is the solvent front. Up to that the solvent front is run. How to draw inference from TLC? If it is a mixture of two dyes, compare with pure dye, a mixture of red dye and on one side I have spotted and which is showing only one spot, whereas on the right hand side the spot shows two red colors, which means that in the right hand side dye mixture which was also a red dye actually contains two components and the left hand side dye is just a single component dye. Now, I will be telling you that the dye can either be seen visually that is because you can see the red color, otherwise it can be put in iodine chamber and all the dyes appear to be brown or bound spots. So, that is what is meant by the inference from TLC. What is column chromatography made of? Column chromatography are like a device having a stopcock at the end and the column is filled up with silica gel. Of course, the silica gel that is used in the case in this case is different from the silica gel that is used for coating the TLC plates. As for the TLC, a very even smearing of the silica gel coating needs to be done. Therefore, it is of finer quality in particle size, but the silica gel which is used in column is slightly coarser and once the silica gel is filled with the help of by making it a slurry, then mixtures of dye can be separated on them. So, that is the purpose of silica gel loading, but the basic function or fundamental uh, property is for the separation or identification and that remains the same for thin layer chromatography and column chromatography. Process of separation, how does it happen? In case of column chromatography, mixtures of components enter a column chromatographic process and the different components are flushed through the system at different rates in different polarity of solvents. These differential rates of migration as the mixture moves over absorptive material provides separation. Repeated sorption, desorption acts that take place during the movement of the sample over the stationary bed determines the rate. The smaller the affinity a molecule has for the stationary phase, the shorter time it will spend on the column. So, it is something which is valid for any and every organic compound, whether it is a dye molecule or any other simple organic molecule. Adsorption and desorption, thus organic compounds are adsorbing and desorbing and adsorbing and desorbing on the column that the rate of illusion will be decided and because there is a long traversing area and because there is a long traversing area, the rate of traversing becomes larger and larger. So, they get separated although it all starts with the mixture, but then gradually because each die has a different rate of traversing on the column. So, therefore, it moves separately and when it moves separately, the movement will be dependent on the fact that how nicely or how not so nicely it is having an affinity for the silica gel. And if it is having good affinity for the silica gel, it would be adhering to the silica gel and therefore, it will not elute fast, but other components will elute and move on the column. Column packing is then very important. One can come to a conclusion 
that it is all a process of absorption and desorption that decide the rate of its flow onto the column and finally, out of the column. In the analysis of natural products, column chromatography specially advantageous as to purify individual chemical compounds from mixture of compounds. Two methods are generally used to prepare a column that is a dry method and a wet method. In most application, the stationary phase either silica gel or alumina which is mixed with an appropriate solvent being used as a mobile phase to yield a thick white slurry is used for column packing. Polarity of the solvent, the mobile phase is a liquid that is chosen to maximize the separation of the sample. This can be water or any other organic solvent. So, it is important what kind of solvent is suitable. We should use the same solvent in which the silica gel slurry has been made. If the polarity of the slurry and the polarity of the solvent that we are subsequently going to use are different, it can cause some kind of erratic movement of the components on the column. Therefore, one should remember that one should only uh, should not abruptly change the polarity. Gradually, the polarity should be changed so that the rate of traversing does not get altered. Different other chromatographic techniques were also used in color identification and isolation from plant species and will be discussed. So, there, so there is this one very basic method of separation and that is by using column chromatography. Before starting the column chromatography, actually a thin layer chromatography is done, so that the difference in the polarity of various components can be understood. And accordingly, the column chromatography is, is started, the column packing and the polarities are adjusted according to the information gathered from the TLC method. Coming to ultraviolet visible spectrophotometric method, this is a method, one method which is quickest and easily doable kind of technique to identify dye molecule. A dye is dissolved in suitable solvent system and scanned through UV visible spectrophotometer. Identification of the dye by this method involves an empirical comparison of the details of the spectrum that is the maximum and the minimum point of unknown with those of the pure compounds. A close match is considered to be good evidence of the chemical identity particularly if the spectrum contains a number of short and well defined peaks. Principles of UV. When a material is illuminated by light, specific wavelengths are absorbed. Depending on the molecular structure, electrons in the ground state molecules absorbing light energy and moving to an excited state cause this. The absorption intensity depends on the wavelength and the absorption spectrum that is the curve measuring absorption intensity changes accompanying wavelength changes for monochromatic light illuminating a material. And it is this characteristic of a specific material, analysis of material based on the principle of absorptiometry. This analysis can be used for various purposes that is identification as well as quantitative analysis of any colorant molecule. Matching lambda max. On identification, 
which can be used for the identification of dye stuff be it natural or synthetic. So, the best way of doing is that light a monochromatic light is passed through the dye or dye stuff and the lambda max is absorbed. This lambda max means the maximum absorption which takes place at a particular wavelength is called lambda max which is very characteristic of a dye. For example, I will tell you that A R 18 and D R 80 show a lambda max of 509 and 544 nanometers respectively. By whichever UV spectrophotometer evaluation of UV spectrum of these two dyes, the lambda max will always show this, which means to prove that the structural details are such that the chromophoric group are in such a manner that it would absorb light related to these two wavelengths only when these dyes are present. So, that is how one tends to identify dyes and that is valid both for synthetic as well as natural dyes. This is how a visible UV visible spectrophotometer looks like and this is available in most of the lab because it is not a very expensive equipment. The UV visible spectrum of dyes, when we compare the two dyes the natural indigo and synthetic indigo, you will find that there are very subtle differences and these subtle differences can be seen in the UV visible spectrum and the synthetic dye shows two peaks from some kind of impurity of the because it has been made in the laboratory. Whereas, the natural dye shows only one peak in the UV region and visible region and that is what is very uh, uh, good understanding of a visible spectrum UV visible spectrum of the indigo dye. Spectral analysis, when a spectrum is evaluated, this is a typical UV spectrum of synthetic indigo and natural indigo. Now, you will see that if even a layman looks at the two peaks, uh, at the two lines one is indicating the synthetic indigo and the other one is indicating the natural indigo. You will say that more or less they look similar, but they are very really very similar, but makes them a little dissimilar in the fact that there is a peak at 285 as shown by natural indigo and is slightly different in the case of synthetic indigo as it shows at 288 nanometer, which is in the UV region. And in the visible region, you will see that natural indigo shows a peak at 603 nanometer and the synthetic indigo shows a peak at 607 nanometers. Although these are very small differences, but even then natural indigo can be identified from synthetic indigo. The result verification, there are very small variations, but nevertheless with the help of UV itself, I told you that one can take the help of TLC also to identify and that whether there are these the sample is a natural indigo or a synthetic indigo can be identified. Similarly, with the help of UV machine one can identify looking carefully at the lambda maxes. So, the lambda max at 288 and 285 are definitely different. Similarly, the lambda max in the visible region that is 603 and 607 are also different. This makes these two molecules different from each other in terms of UV spectrum. Coming to Fourier transformed infrared spectrometry, the next machine that helps us to identify the dye molecule is Fourier transform infrared spectrometry or FTIR. And this only identifies the peaks of functional groups and because of the stretching and bending vibrations that the FTIR 
or the IR rays caused to the molecule, the absorption of the infrared region is due to the molecular vibration of one kind or the other. The spectrum is generally very complicated and contains many absorption peaks. Nevertheless, there is a region which is for the interest of the analyst and there is one region which is very, very specific which needs not to be understood fully because that does not give any detailed information. So, if we know what are the functional groups through FTIR, at least the that region's information is good enough and we can derive at a conclusion that the molecular structure contains the functional groups like hydroxyl, carbonyl, amino, nitroso and so on. IR absorption spectrometry or spectroscopy is based on the absorption of IR radiation by molecules and I am all along mentioning molecules because dyes are also molecules, organic molecules and is most widely used for the identification of organic compounds. The atoms in the molecules vibrate constantly in a variety of stretching and bending motion. The different types of motions are collectively called the vibrational modes. Atoms that are connected by covalent bonds can stretch or bend at natural resonance frequency which is dependent on the strength or stiffness of the bond. Different vibration modes, a C, C, C bond, single bond C will show a vibration mode at 1200 centimeter inverse, carbon carbon double bond will show at 1650 centimeter inverse and carbon carbon triple bond will show at 21 to 22 centim 100 centimeter inverse. Now you see that if you we look at the C single bond C, C double bond C, C triple bond C, the variation is very prominent. If we simply take these three even in the molecule can show whether they have these particular moieties or functional groups in their structure or not. And this is how the FTIR machine looks like. And it is a small machine which most of the laboratories have. Now, what does IR ray do? Part information can be obtained and the beauty of this is that infrared radiation cannot cause electronic transition as what was happening in UV light or visible light. So, what does it do? It only plays around with the covalent bond stretching, bending and all kinds of vibrational boards and by that itself that change will only occur. If the infrared radiation of the matching frequency hits the molecule or not otherwise. So, this compatibility of infrared radiation matching with the requirement of the bond C double bond C or C single bond C any covalent bond then only the vibration mode will occur. The double bond and the triple bond are stronger than the single bond and have correspondingly higher energies of vibration. Similarly, stretching modes have higher energies than bending modes of the same atoms. These vibrational modes can be excited to higher energy states which cause the atom to vibrate with great amplitude that is greater displacement from the average position. Vibrational energy, now you imagine that there is a pendulum and it is of a kind that will go high as energy as the high energy is and energization would take place. Vibrations can be excited by increasing the temperature or by absorption of photons of the appropriate energy. The energies of the vibrational modes are quantized and can be excited only with discrete amount of energy. A photon that has the same energy as vibration is said to be resonance with that of the vibration that can be absorbed. So, when it is in resonance with the requirement energy or vibration for a particular bond 
or when it is matching or when it is compatible you may say either of them that is the time when it will affect the body and that affection will be implication that will cause, cause absorption peaks to come in the spectrum. So, vibrational energy plays a very vital role in identifying the, fi the functional groups in a particular molecule. The IR spectrum of indigo dye looks natural indigo dye looks like this and the IR spectrum of the synthetic dye does show some differences. An IR spectrum of natural dyes there are certain portion marks as A, B, C, D and these are found to be quite different from the synthetic indigo dye IR and that is the reason how they were being even identified with the help of IR spectrum. Now coming to high performance liquid chromatography, this the applicability of HPLC was used to analyze ancient textile dyes for the first time successfully by water in 1985. So, it is quite recent, it is not a very old technique which has been applied to dye molecules. HPLC linear gradient elution method was first described by the analysis of indigo dyes by Wouter and Verhochem in 1991. Identification of blue and purple indigo dyes was also described using HPLC techniques by Wouter. Analysis of mangista alizarine, turmeric, sandalwood were carried out much later in the year 1999 by Bhattacharya using HPLC technique. So, you see that how useful it is for the identification of natural dyes and various different types of dyes, indigoid dyes, anthroquinoid dyes and even turmeric which is a curcumoid dye and many other dyes can be identified with the help of HPLC. Now, I am going back to again the HPLC chromatogram of synthetic indigo and natural indigo. You will say that these two peaks look alike, but there are subtle differences. Taking an example of the chromatogram, the graph that is generated from the chromatographic technique is called chromatogram and the graph that is generated from spectroscopic method is called spectrum. So, here we are talking about chromatogram. The synthetic indigo and the chromatogram of the natural indigo are shown. You can see that there are small differences, but nevertheless they all appear to be similar while looking in the first go, but when the peaks are identified and their RF is you know checked, there are subtle differences and that also helps in identification of the synthetic and the natural indigo. Comparative and absolute analysis. Now, when we are trying to look at chromatographic techniques, there is one thing which is very important that I should tell you that it is that one needs a standard. That means, it is a comparative method. You have a unknown sample, but you should also have a known sample which is called a standard because it is a comparative analytical method. Whereas, UV is an absolute in an analysis, IR is an absolute analysis, there you do not need any standard. You do not need another standard to compare, it gives functional group information from IR and it gives chromatographic uh, sorry chromophoric group information from the UV. But in the case of chromatographic techniques, one needs to have a standard molecule of the same. Suppose if we want to evaluate the HPLC of alizarine in a Mangis sample, we will use a calibration method of in HPLC in order to be able to identify alizarine in Mangis 
we should have a pure sample of alizarine and that is called as standard. So, this kind of method is called calibration method and therefore, one needs to have very pure samples of these standards in order to identify dyes in mixture and in natural dye there is also another problematic situation because no dye comes as single molecule. So, they are always 4 or 5 or maybe even more similarly structured molecules which have very little difference, but nevertheless they are different entities. So, therefore, a standard is a must in case of HPLC usage. Now, coming to gas chromatography, one can use gas chromatography alone or can use it with the help of mass spectrometric studies. Gas chromatography with mass spectrometry is known as GCMS and gas chromatography alone is called GC. And it is an important detection method for natural products because it provides chemical fingerprints of the peaks from the peaks. Electron impact source that is EI an automated library searching facility makes chemical identification very easy. The gas chromatography serves as a method of separation of a mixture so that they enter the mass detector one at a time for identification. So, the chromatography actually only separates them and the mass detector then starts detecting them and finding out whether the fragmentation pattern is of the known compound or it is of unknown compound or a different compound and that can be done with the help of library search. Importance of mass fragmentation. Now, here I would like to emphasize that all organic molecules whether they are dye molecules or they are colorless molecules, they all have a set fragmentation pattern and therefore, the mass fragmentation pattern is very characteristic of a particular compound itself. Two compounds on a gas chromatography can show the same retention time, but they may or may not be the same just based on retention time or retardation factor one cannot determine, but mass fragmentation when checked and tallied that is the ultimate determination whether the molecule is same or not. And therefore, it is one of the most serious kind of diagnostic tests for identification of any dye molecule. And again and again I am telling it can be applied to both synthetic dyes as well as natural dyes. Now, when we look at lycopene, it is a dye molecule. Lycopene has a molecular ion peak at 537 which is the tallest peak as you can see and there is a peak at 536 as well. So, the main molecular ion peak is 536 and m plus 1 is the sometimes such peaks arrive due to fragmentation pattern which appears at 537 and when 537 breaks it gives a peak of 444 which is prominent with a loss of 92 m amu atomic mass unit and then subsequently a peak at 391 and then at 347 and at 321 and so on. And this when back calculated derives the structure of lycopene because the molecule will fragment firstly in a similar manner whichever mass spectrometry instrument one uses. The fragmentation pattern remains the same because the most labile bonds will break and that is the reason why mass fragmentation pattern remains the same even if the machine is altered. 
Then we come to nuclear magnetic resonance spectrometry. This is a preeminent technique for determining the structure of organic compounds. It is the only one method for which a complete analysis and interpretation of the entire spectrum is normally expected and all this among all the spectroscopic methods. This technique relies on the ability of the atomic nuclei to behave like a small magnet and align themselves with an external magnetic field. When irradiated with radio frequency signal, the nuclei in the molecule can change from being aligned with the magnetic field to identify and or elucidate detailed structural information about the chemical compounds. NMR can differentiate between structural isomers and provide information about connectivity between atoms within the molecule. So, here it is slightly more complicated, but once it is mastered, it can give good results from the, uh, the NMR spectrum. Here, the as the name suggests, it is the nuclei which is aligning in the magnetic field and when it starts resonating, a spectrum is formed. There are two types of NMR which are very popularly used for structure elucidation. One is the proton NMR which gives an idea about the number of hydrogen that are present and the number of carbon NMR gives or the carbon 13 NMR gives the number of carbon that are present and the entire spectrum can be interpreted. Therefore, it gives quite a discrete information about the structural details of a molecule, be it a more organic molecule or be it a dye molecule. Coming to mass spectrometry, we did understand a bit of mass spectrometry when we were talking about GCMS part, but to be able to explain to you in a more detailed manner, because this is also one of the tools for identification of dye molecules. So, dye molecules can be fragmented in mass spectrometry. If a pure sample is inserted directly, we do not need the GC part and the mass spectrometry converts them into ions. They can be moved about and manipulated by external electrical and magnetic fields. The mass spectrometry is used to identify unknown compounds and quantify known compounds. It is sensitive and selective and is commonly used in combination with other separation techniques like gas or liquid chromatography to analyze complex mixtures. A mass spectrometer determines the mass of a molecule by measuring the mass to charge ratio that is m by z of its ion. Ions are generated by including either the loss or gain of a charge from a neutral species. Once formed, ions are electrostatically directed into the mass analyzer where they are separated according to their m by z and finally detected. The result of molecular ionization, ion separation and ion detection. The spectrum that can provide molecular mass and even structural information is the ultimate in identification of molecular structure of the dye or any organic molecule. So, in conclusion we can say an ultimate method for the determination of structure of an organic compound and therefore, it is called a spectrometric method, but it does not use any energy from the electromagnetic radiation region unlike UV, FTIR and NMR. Mass spectrometry is a standalone method. It does not use the electromagnetic radiation because in UV, UV light or visible light is 
from electromagnetic radiation. In FTIR, IR radiations are used with uh, even in NMR the radio frequencies are being used, but in mass spectrometry method where the molecule in the organic uh, if it is an organic molecule which can be a dye is bombarded with an electronic beam and the molecule starts fragmenting. This fragmentation pattern is always the same and therefore, it is like the only method of fragmentation of the molecule. The molecule will break from the parts where the bonds are most labile and that fragmentation pattern can always remain or will always remain the same be it any mass spectrophotometer. So, in conclusion what we have learnt in this lecture that first we do a solubility test just to check which colorant is present whether it is a dye or a pigment if it is soluble it is a dye. Then we went on to see that there are four chromatographic techniques thin layer chromatography, column chromatography which is based on the same principle absorption, desorption, adsorption, desorption and using an appropriate solvent helps to separate these compounds. Then we saw gas chromatography which is meant for volatile compounds only. So, we do not use too much of gas chromatography in dye structural determination. Nevertheless, we use HPLC which is high performance liquid chromatography. It is also called high pressure liquid chromatography and there it is again a technique where a column is used. There is an internal coating on in the column and the compound adsorb, desorb the same phenomena is done in a pressurized manner. And once they are separated, they are purified, then they are taken for identification for mass fragmentation or they can be taken for other uh, UV or IR or NMR techniques. Let me also emphasize one last thing that unless and until we have a pure compound which can be obtained through chromatography, we cannot do spectroscopy and we should not do spectroscopy because spectroscopy of mixed compounds will not lead to any conclusion. Therefore, chromatography and spectroscopy go hand in hand. Chromatography is meant for separation and spectroscopy is meant for analysis of separated purified compound. I hope that I have tried to make the identification and the characterization of dye molecules simple. By using these techniques, we are able to identify these molecules in a most efficient manner. UV and IR can give only part information. UV gives information about the chromophores, IR gives information of the molecule having certain functional groups, NMR gives the number of hydrogen that are present in a molecule and carbon 13 NMR gives information about the carbon backbone, the number of carbon that are present in the molecules, but the ultimate identification comes from mass spectrometry which does not use any electromagnetic radiation region, but is a standalone electronically bombarded molecule gives its fragmentations which break at only certain points. The fragments can be back calculated to identify the whole structure. So, with this we have come to an end of this lecture. Thank you.
Hello, I am Professor A.K. Sharma and I teach sociology in IIT Kanpur. Uh, I am taking up a question, uh, what is world population crisis? Uh, world population crisis uh, refers to explosive growth of population which occurred during 1950s and 1960s. For uh, millions of years, uh, some people estimate that perhaps man appeared on this planet earth 5 lakhs years ago. It took uh, these 5 lakhs years for world population to reach first billion in 1820 AD. And that means that the population in ancient times must have been rising at rate 0 0.000 something percent per year. Now, in 1950s and 1960s in the world, you find that population started growing at rate more than 2 percent per year. This is what is meant by population crisis. You can imagine that if a population grows or anything grows at 2 percent per year, then in about 35 years time it can double. And obviously, uh, particularly in the context of less developed countries, it had implications for poverty removal, for employment generation, for maintaining health, improving life expectancy, raising educational levels, etc. Et the reason behind this uh, population crisis was uh, improvement in life expectancy or improvement in general health standards of populations. Uh, you may not be knowing or you will be surprised to know that about 100 years ago in our country, life expectancy means average age of death or average age of life, whatever you say, of a newly born child was only 20 years and today it has reached the level of 68 years. Much of this improvement in less developed countries occurred uh, in 1950s and 60s and therefore, uh, with improvement in health, improvement in life expectancy or average age of birth, uh, average age of death, uh, population started growing at explosive rates and people started writing about this. This is population explosion or this, this is population crisis. And uh, uh, now, one can say that the period of peak growth rate is over and from 1971 onwards in the world as well as in our country growth rate of population has started declining. Now, in India you may like to know what is the current growth rate of India's population. Currently India's population is growing at 1.5 percent per year and the reason is that after um, uh, sudden or unexpected improvement in health conditions in 50s and 60s which led to population crisis, we find that today average number of children has also started coming down. So, there was a time when average number of children per woman was around 11 or 12, now it has come down to 2.5 and therefore, the growth rate of India's population has come down to 1.5 percent and we can hope that in the future means in the coming decades, even if nothing changes on the front of fertility or number of children, India's growth rate of population will decrease further and eventually come to a zero level. As said by the 11th five year plan of India and now the major cause of high growth rate of population is not high fertility, but the age distribution of population. So, we have a high percentage of population at the younger ages and that, uh, that is the cause of high rate of growth of population. Eventually, when population of India will also age like population of other developed countries, our growth rate will start falling. Thank you. Now, we will meet in the future. Sir.